The subject of this Irish folklore video was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. You can help vote to decide what kind of content I make by signing up for as little as $1 a month. I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and this is the third or possibly fourth attempt at filming this video in the past two weeks. I have to say, I'm very disappointed that St. Patrick, the least interesting of all the Irish saints, was the one chosen to represent Ireland rather than, say, St. Columbana, who was not only the first person to see the Loch Ness Monster, but also wrestled with it. Or St. Bridget, who would use magic to steal land from landlords. Or maybe St. Brendan the Navigator. Now, it may take some convincing to persuade you that Brendan should be counted up there with a man who fist fought the Loch Ness Monster and an anti-capitalist darling from before capitalism was a thing, but just give me a moment. Now, the story of the voyage of St. Brendan owes a lot to the old Irish Imrama storytelling tradition. Imrama being an old Irish word that means voyage. In the Imrama stories, a great hero and his followers would set sail, usually westward, and they would come upon many different islands, each with its own unique supernatural attributes or inhabitants, and have many, many adventures, before returning home, usually after several years, and usually with at least one or two crew members missing, and tell everyone about everything they had seen. These voyages were usually in search of High Brasil, which was a mythological island somewhere off to the west coast of Ireland that was said to be wreathed in mist constantly except for one week every seven years, which was the only time it could be found. The similarities between the name High Brasil and Brazil are pure coincidence, as disappointing as that may be. The texts we have for the Imrama stories would have been recorded and written down by Christian monks, and thus would have had a lot of Christian ideas and Christian interpretations pushed onto them, and would the characters would have been made to reference Christianity by the monks writing it down. But nowhere in any of the Imrama stories is this more prevalent and obvious than in the voyage of St. Brendan. Obviously, it's about a Christian saint, literally sailing to heaven. So now I'm going to divert very quickly to the Middle East to talk about another influence on the voyage of St. Brendan besides the Amrama stories. And these were the stories of the Desert Fathers and Desert Mothers. Uh, desert Fathers and Mothers were religious leaders such as Pacomius, Anthony the Great and Hilarion, who would go out into the desert, either to sequester themselves or set up a monastery in the relative isolation of the desert as a form of asceticism. Asceticism being severe self-discipline and self-denial, which was said to be like, because Christianity was no longer being suppressed by the Roman Empire and Christian leaders no longer had a legitimate source of martyrdom, they had to inflict martyrdom upon themselves in some way. And that's what the ascetic traditions were for, so that they could carry on the feeling of martyrdom without actually being martyred. Uh, you may be wondering what a bunch of monks and priests and monasteries in the desert in the Middle East might have to do with an Irish monk sailing out to sea for years on it. And while Stories of the Desert Fathers and Mothers certainly did make their way over to Ireland and many Irish monks and religious leaders would have wanted to emulate what they did and really pull out that ascetic aesthetic. There isn't exactly a huge abundance of deserts in Ireland. And so they would set sail for months or years at a time or sometimes make themselves hermits on small islands so that they could get the same kind of isolation, the same kind of asceticism as the Desert Fathers and Mothers, but 
Berlin somewhere more environmentally accessible to people living on an island. Now, there's a lot of examples of asceticism in the voyage of St. Brendan. Brendan and his monks, they fast for 40 days and 40 nights before setting out on their journey. Brendan is constantly forbidding the monks from eating or drinking when they come upon food before finding some sign from God that it is appropriate to do so. When they get stranded in calm, still waters, Brendan says they must pull in the oars and take down the sails and trust in the will of God. And when they find St. Paul, Brendan and Paul have an argument about which one of them is inflicting the most suffering upon themselves and therefore is the most beloved by God. It's all over the place. It's a major running theme throughout the story of St. Brendan's voyage. Now, this idea of monks and holy people going out sailing on long voyages and hermiting themselves upon islands in order to emulate the desert fathers and mothers was almost definitely influenced by the already extant indigenous Imrama storytelling traditions of Ireland. And so we could see the voyage of St. Brendan as being like a kind of fusion between the native Imrama storytelling tradition and the traditions of the Desert Fathers and Mothers that had come to Ireland from the Middle East. And more than that, the story of the voyage of St. Brendan, it spread throughout Europe and many European countries have their own version of the story. It's always about St. Brendan, who was always from Ireland, but they each incorporate different elements into the story that reflect local storytelling traditions, which is normal. It's called a migratory legend, though it's a less extreme example of a migratory legend than others you could see, such as uh, the Wild Hunt is a very good example of I'll go into the Wild Hunt in another video. That's an entirely different video. <laughs> uh, down through the centuries, people have tried to identify the various islands that St. Brendan landed upon and the land of promise itself. And while whether or not he actually went on this voyage is kind of in doubt, he was a, almost certainly a real person. There almost definitely was a St. Brendan. Now uh, you may be thinking that, of course, how are they going to identify any of these places? He sailed by an island where demons were throwing flaming weapons at the boat and a giant crystal pillar floating on the sea. Those aren't real things. But you have to remember how much people tend to embellish stories, for one thing, they would add fantastical elements to a fairly average sea voyage story just to make it more interesting. And also, how an interpretation of the unfamiliar may come across as fantastical. For example, the island with the demons throwing flaming weapons at the ship. Well, what if we have a medieval Irish monk? seeing a volcano erupt for the first time ever and having absolutely no idea what it was. Or the, the great big crystal pillar could have been an iceberg. And those interpretations of what was seen have been around for a long time. As I said, down through the centuries, people have tried to work out what place the land of promise would be. And it was called St. Brendan's Isle. And some have even hazarded the guess that it is, in fact, North America and that we have reached it and discovered it and it's a real place. And they use this to say that it was, in fact, St. Brendan who was the first person from Europe to reach North America. In fact, the adventurer, Tim Severin, he even reconstructed St. Brendan's ship with period materials and proved that it was possible for St. Brendan to have made the voyage by actually doing it himself in a period ship. But I still don't think it's likely. I don't think it's likely because there's only two very flimsy pieces of evidence to suggest it. One is that the Vikings said that 
the Irish had reached North America before they did, and two, it was because people just kept not finding St. Brendan's Island, the land of promise, and just kept pushing it further westward, which is a very flimsy reason. That's an incredibly flimsy piece of evidence. It's a little sheet of paper. It's like soggy toilet paper as evidence. Stop that. I don't think it's likely, because the story mostly describes St. Brendan as sailing east, not west. He only sails west for a few days at the end, which would put the land of promise, the Isle of St. Brendan, only a little bit westward of Ireland, which is where most people guessed it was, and not on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. That doesn't make sense. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some archaeologist working in North America will end up unearthing an ore or some rosary beads or a fragment of a Bible dating back to medieval Ireland and it'll be evidence that St. Brendan's voyage did actually take him all the way to North America, but I doubt it. Thanks for watching this video on analyzing the voyage of St. Brendan. Yes, I'm doing the analysis and the stories separately now, which I have to say is making a huge difference to my productivity. It's much, much easier doing it this way, and now I get to do fun little editing jokes in the analysis again, which is nice. It's very nice. It's going to let me be way more productive, and it's also good for the algorithm, because the more often I upload, the more YouTube likes me. But especially thanks to all of my Patreons, including Ash Carp and the other names you see scrolling across the screen. If you want to support me and my work, you can sign up to Patreon. You can donate to my Kofi. You can buy my merch designed by my wonderful wife. Or, or if you don't have money, that's also totally fine. Likes, comments, subscribing, sharing, that's all very, very, very useful and really helps me a lot. So thank you if you do that. Now you may have noticed things have changed a little bit and they're going to be changing more. They're going to be changing a lot and that's okay, change is good, even if it's a little bit scary. So the changes, they're going to be even more in the coming months, so look forward to that and do remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies. Around Terra del Fuego and up the warm Gulf stream He crossed the last horizon, Mount Brandon was in sight And when he cleared the customs into Dingle for the night